this time on Frank Buckley Interviews, we're talking about the U.S. Supreme Court, the highest court in the land. The court's rulings by nine justices setting legal precedent on some of the most controversial issues and divisive topics in our nation's history. Slavery, abortion, immigration, race, and free speech. The court's rulings transcend simple law and order. They reach deep into our culture and affect the daily lives of millions of Americans. Now, one of our nation's most preeminent legal scholars is arguing that on one issue, the court is failing to uphold the very constitutional rights it's meant to protect. He works to make his case in the new book, Presumed Guilty, how the Supreme Court empowered the police and subverted civil rights. And I'm delighted to welcome the author, the dean of the UC Berkeley School of Law, Erwin Shemerensky, to Frank Buckley Interviews. Dean Shemerensky, it is great to see you. Thanks for joining us. It's truly my pleasure. Uh, before we get to this compelling subject of your book, I want to ask you about the new Supreme Court term uh, just getting underway. The court is expected to rule on some major issues, including abortion. What can we expect from this court, especially from the three newest members appointed during the Trump administration, Kavanaugh, Barrett, and Gorsuch? Do you expect the court to overturn Roe v. Wade? I think the Supreme Court is likely to uphold the Mississippi law that prohibits abortions after the 15th week of pregnancy. Whether they'll explicitly overrule Roe v. Wade, I don't know. But allowing this Mississippi law will at least say to states that they can prohibit abortion before viability. I just can't count to five votes on the current court justices to strike down the law or to rule in favor of abortion rights. And what are some of the other major issues that, that you'll be tracking during this term? There's an important case concerning gun rights. New York restricts the ability to have concealed weapons outside the home. A person would need to get a concealed weapons permit, and that requires showing a need with regard to safety. I think the Supreme Court is likely to expand Second Amendment rights and limit the ability of the government to restrict guns. There's a major case coming out of religion out of name. What it involves is if a state provides aid for secular private schools, is it constitutionally required by that same aid for religious schools? Again, I think the conservatives on the court are going to push hard in the direction of aid to religion. You, you use the word conservative, and, and people, I think, look at the Supreme Court today as another political body, conservative justices and liberal justices. Is it indeed a political body, and has it always been this political? We have to be careful about the word political. In one sense, the justices aren't political. No one can go lobby the justices in the way you can lobby an elected official. As far as we know, the justices never trade votes with one another as members of a legislature might. But if what we mean by political is ideological, then the justices are very ideological. That's been true throughout American history. The Republicans blocked Merrick Garland and rushed through Amy Coney Barrett because they know the identity of the justice, the views of the justice make all the difference. Right now, we have six justices who are appointed by Republican presidents, all are right of center. We have three justices appointed by Democratic presidents, all are left of center. And that's why we're seeing so many 6-3 votes on the current court. And as a legal scholar, of course, you, you understand the nuances of these justices and the legal decisions that they make. We in the public, is it hard for people to, to have confidence in the Supreme Court as this legal, independent group of thinkers to look at the law and to give us decisions that are for the greater good, given that they are all political appointees, essentially? I think people have to accept that these are human beings who are making value choices. The reality is the Constitution says nothing about abortion. But the Supreme Court in 1973 said part of a woman's liberty under the Constitution is the right to choose whether to terminate a pregnancy. Right now, that right is in danger because of the justices who are on the court. The Constitution is written in very broad, open-ended language. And the meaning depends so much on who are the justices? What are their values? What's their ideology? Hmm. 
Let's get to your, your compelling book, Presumed Guilty. And you assert in this book that essentially the Supreme Court has effectively been complicit in enabling the police to engage in police misconduct um, and suspending or subverting civil rights. Tell us how so. The Constitution contains many provisions that are meant to limit the police. The Fourth Amendment limits when the police can search or stop or arrest somebody. The Fifth Amendment, privilege and self-incrimination, limits how the police can question someone. Due process of law is meant to limit the police. But throughout American history, the Supreme Court has rarely used these provisions to limit the police. Instead, it's very much empowered the police. And that's led to the racialized policing we have today and throughout American history. The reality is that a black man has nine times the chance of being killed by police that a white man does. A Latino has four times the chance of being killed compared to a white person. Studies in every city, including Los Angeles, show that police stop blacks and Latinos far more often than whites, holding everything else constant. And I think we have to put a lot of the blame for this at the Supreme Court. And, and George Floyd looms large in this book. You argue that the Supreme Court may actually have played a role in his death when they decided a case from nearly four decades ago called the City of Los Angeles v. Lyons. Tell us about that case. It's coming from Los Angeles. It involves a 24-year-old man, Adolph Lyons, who was stopped by the police late one night for having a burnt-out taillight. An officer ordered Lyons out of his car. The officer slammed Lyons' hands above his head onto the roof of the car. Lyons complained that the keys that he was holding were cutting into the skin of his palm. The officer thought Lyons was, quote, mouthing off, and the officer administered a choke call to Lyons and rendered him unconscious. Lyons awoke. He had urinated and defecated. He was spitting blood and dirt. The officer gave Lyons a traffic ticket and allowed him to go. Lyons did some research and discovered at that point 16 people in Los Angeles had died from police use of the chokehold, most all like him, African-American men. Lyons sued the city of Los Angeles for an injunction to stop police from using the chokehold except when necessary to check the officer's life or safety. But the Supreme Court ruled five to four that Lyons could not sue. The court said Lyons could not show that it was likely that he personally would choke again in the future. The court said in order for someone to sue for an injunction, to stop the police or the government doing something, they have to show a likelihood of personal future injury. Well, no one ever is going to be able to show that he or she is likely to be choked in the future. So no court can issue an injunction. Had the court ruled differently, the chokehold could have been stopped as unconstitutional. In the lives of George Floyd, Eric Garner, and so many others who died from police in the chokehold might have been saved. Police uh, advocates might say the police have such a difficult job. They have to protect the public and themselves, and they have to have tools with which to do it. On the one hand, we are saying to them, please don't shoot uh, innocent people. But then when they use a, quote, non-lethal form of policing, that uh, you're suggesting that they shouldn't do that either. Are police in a no-win situation? Police are in an enormously difficult situation. I have great admiration for police. I strongly disagree with those who advocate abolishing the police. But police also have the ability to take away people's liberty and even their lives. Los Angeles, many years ago, on its own, prohibited use of the chokehold. California law, a year ago, prohibited police from using the chokehold. Congress has a bill that would do so for the entire country. So I think we can eliminate the chokehold without unduly restricting the police in their difficult job. Tell us about another case that, that you write about uh, in your book. It's Terry v. Ohio. And, and what are the effects today? The case decided by the Supreme Court in 1968 involved a couple of men on a public sidewalk in Cleveland who were walking back and forth. A police officer was suspicious seeing this. Now, it's worth noting that the two men were black and the officer was white. And the officer then stops them, frisks them, finds that they have guns, and arrests them for that. Well, the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution says 
that the police can search somebody only if there is probable cause that the person has committed a crime. But the United States Supreme Court said police can stop and frisk somebody without needing probable cause so long as there is reasonable suspicion, which has never been defined, the police are allowed to stop and frisk. This very much increased racialized policing. The statistics are stunning about how much more often blacks and Latinos are stopped and frisked by the police. And even though whites are much more likely found with weapons or contraband. All right, we are gonna take a short break right now. When we get back, We'll have more with Erwin Shemerinsky. He's the dean of the UC Berkeley School of Law and author of the new book, Presumed Guilty, How the Supreme Court Empowered the Police and Subverted Civil Rights. And welcome back to Frank Buckley Interviews. Uh, let's continue our conversation with the dean of the UC Berkeley School of Law, Erwin Shemerinsky. He's written a new book, Presumed Guilty, How the Supreme Court Empowered the Police and Subverted Civil Rights. Uh, dean Shemerinsky, you write in the book that, quote, rights have meaning only if they can be enforced, unless police face consequences for violations. The rights are just hollow, unfulfilled promises. In what ways can the victims of police misconduct enforce those rights? Well, the most important protection for a victim is the ability to sue. And so if somebody's rights are violated, they can sue for money damages. The suit for money damages can compensate them for their injuries. It also can deter others in the future from violating the rights. The problem is that the Supreme Court has made it very difficult for those who are injured by the police to be able to successfully sue. It's very hard to sue the local government that employs the police. Cities are liable only if their own policies violate the Constitution. And in terms of officers, the Supreme Court has said they have what's called qualified immunity. They can be held liable only if they violate clearly established law that every reasonable officer should know. Well, in fact, that was one of the hang-ups in the attempt to pass a police reform bill recently was this idea of qualified immunity and officers said look we are doing our jobs if we are worried about being sued every time we uh, go out the door uh, we may not be able to do our jobs we may not be able to protect ourselves and the public to that you say what again i think we need to protect the police but we also need to make sure that those whose rights are violated have a remedy the bill in Congress would not have eliminated qualified immunity. It would have said, though, that if the police act in bad faith, if they violate somebody's rights maliciously, the individual should be able to recover. The Supreme Court, in a series of decisions that I describe in the book, have made qualified immunity much more like absolute immunity, hmm. keeping injured people from recovering at all. The bill passed the House of Representatives and would have, I think, made important changes with regard to qualified immunity. Unfortunately, it stalled in the Senate and was unlikely to get through there because of the filibuster. You said for, in, in your book that for most of America's history that the Supreme Court was relatively quiet on this idea of police powers. What prompted the change and when did that start to happen? For the first century of American history, you find almost no Supreme Court cases dealing with any aspect of policing. That starts to change in the late 19th century and early 20th century. One of the things that happened is that's when the federal government develops its first law enforcement offices, such as the FBI. And it was prohibition that was responsible for that and the effort of the federal government to enforce prohibition. Also, it was thought until the late 19th and early 20th century, that the Bill of Rights, including the provisions of the police, applied only to federal government. They didn't apply to state and local governments. And so it took the Supreme Court saying that, yes, the First Amendment about speech or the Fourth Amendment about police searches do apply to state and local governments as well. You talk about the fact that effectively throughout our history, the Supreme Court has tilted in favor of police, but there was a moment uh, and it was the Earl Warren Court, 
when some things came into place that gave more protections, as it were, to the public versus the police in that, in that clash. And one of the things that came out of that was the Miranda warning. Talk to us about that and talk to us about uh, the Earl Warren court. Sure. We were talking earlier about the court being liberal versus conservative. Throughout American history, except for the Warren court, it's overall been a conservative court. And conservative courts tend to favor law enforcement over those whose rights have been violated. The Warren Court was in 1953 to 1969, and it had a liberal majority from 1962 to 1969. Earl Warren, a graduate of this law school, University of California, Berkeley, was the chief justice. He was a former district attorney, a former state attorney general, as well as governor, and I think he was very sensitive, based on that experience, to the problems of policing. And in 1966, he wrote the opinion in Miranda versus Arizona that said, police questioning a person in custody is inherently coercive. So to protect the person being questioned from coercion, police have to give warnings. And everyone who watches police shows knows the warnings by heart. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you. Your right to a lawyer. If you can't afford one, one will be provided. And the hope of the Warren Court was that this might lessen the coercion for custodial police interrogation. There have been throughout history so many rulings that seem to go against people of color. The Dred Scott decision, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, which essentially upheld separate but equal. Korematsu versus the United States, which said that the incarceration of Americans of Japanese descent during World War, War II was justified. Why does this keep happening? Some of it is that the Supreme Court responds to public pressure. The justices live in society. So the justices reflected the social attitudes in Korematsu when they upheld the Japanese evacuation and internment. The justices reflected the popular sentiment when they upheld separate but equal. But I argue in this book and other books that we should expect more of our Supreme Court than that. We should ask our court to stand up to public pressure and to advance rights. Korematsu was an inexplicable, awful decision, as was Dred Scott, as was Plessy versus Ferguson. And when you think about this shift to a more conservative court now in our present day, what do you believe that will mean for people of color today in America? Unfortunately, attitudes with regard to the Constitution and race very much break down along liberal and conservative lines. So the conservative justice on the Supreme Court, including a very recent decision, have very much gutted the Voting Rights Act making it very difficult now to challenge laws in places like Texas and Georgia and Florida that were intended to disenfranchise minority voters. I think that the Roberts Court, given its current composition, is going to end affirmative action in the United States. I think that the Roberts Court is going to make it much more difficult to prove unconstitutional race discrimination. All right. On that note, we're going to take one final break. Uh, when we get back, we'll have more with the dean of the UC Berkeley School of Law, Erwin Shemarinsky. And we're back with Erwin Shemarinsky, dean of the UC Berkeley School of Law. Before we go, we are entering this new term of the Supreme Court. As you look at these uh, justices, and specifically looking at the new conservative members, can you handicap this court for us? And are there any particular justices that you think might surprise us? Chief Justice Roberts is not new on the court, but he often surprises us and that he's the justice most likely to side with the three liberals. I think it's possible that Justice Kavanaugh could end up being the most moderate, the swing justice on the court. But keep in mind, everything we know about Brett Kavanaugh from his entire career is that he's very politically conservative. Hmm. Before we go, fun, one final question, and that is related to what you're saying in your book. Is it possible to have an effective police force and at the same time 
uh, maintain individual civil rights? Absolutely. I think that we have to have an effective police force. We also have to protect civil rights. And the point I make in the last chapter is that state legislatures can reform the police. California just adopted a number of new laws to do that. City councils and police commissions can, Congress can, state courts can as well. And and to that end, actually, I'll I'll just add another case. The uh, Governor Newsom uh, recently signed a bill, essentially saying that if a police officer is found to engage in misconduct of a severe nature, that he can he or she can be decertified. Is that an effective reform? It's an essential reform. Almost every other state has a law like this. It keeps the so-called bad cop from moving from department to department. The legislature adopted a number of bills to reform policing in California. They were signed by Gavin Newsom, and that's an important one among them. All right. My thanks uh, to uh, the dean of Berkeley Law now, no longer Bolt Hall, uh, Dean Erwin Shemarinsky. He is the author of Presumed Guilty, How the Supreme Court Empowered the Police and Subverted Civil Rights. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And thanks to you for watching. I hope you'll join us on the audio podcast as well later this week, where we will continue the conversation.